Aren't you glad to be in church today? Good to see everyone. We thank the Lord for his presence that's met with us here today. We're just believing for great things. And uh, we know that we've already experienced some wonderful things. I shared with the congregation a few days ago about Anna being uh, healed of lupus, which is absolutely a God thing. And we thank the Lord for that. And uh, Richard Chandler got a report back a few days ago. He is totally cancer free. And we give the Lord praise. And Rita, we're looking forward to sharing that same announcement in, in a few weeks. We're believing God. God's going to do what no man can do. Aren't you thankful that he's a healer? He's a deliverer. He's a way maker. He's simply amazing, and he's worthy of all of our praise. Can you put your hands together one more time? Let's just thank the Lord for who he is. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is so good, and uh, we're excited today to have the Lease family with us, or part of them, and we're thankful for uh, Lisa and Lisa's ministry. Uh, she's no stranger to this congregation. I know that um, we have uh, benefited greatly by her services. Many of you have met with her on occasion, and uh, she's been a tremendous help. I can't think of anyone who cannot benefit uh, from good biblical Christian counseling. And uh, there was a time uh, when I was growing up, and even as far back, uh, or not that far back as uh, maybe 15 or 20 years ago, that there was a negative stigma that was attached to counseling. So many people thought, well, you know, if you go to counseling, you're crazy. Uh, but that's not true. It's absolutely not true. And I appreciate people that are qualified and capable to give good, sound advice uh, based in God's word. And uh, that is such a benefit. And I told her when we invited her to come that we wanted her to just share whatever the Lord laid on her heart. We haven't asked her to speak on any particular subject. I just said, you know, come and minister. Do whatever you feel led to do. And, and we appreciate her ministry. She is a very busy person, but we're thankful that she was able to be with us here today. I want you to join me in this. We make her welcome as she comes. Sister Lisa Lease, God bless you today. Doing the sound man's instruction. <laughs> it's so, so good to be with all of you here today. Thank you for coming out. I'm so thankful for this opportunity to speak and just love the Baileys. Thank you so much for the invitation and everything that you've personally meant to me. Um, they had a foundational piece, a part of my life. Um, there was a lot of healing that happened and I wanna thank them for that. I wanna thank them more than you know, Sister Wendy, more than you know. <laughs> and then of course, the Smiths, oh, I love you too. You guys are amazing, thank you so much for your friendship and just who you are as individuals. And I love that my husband is here and his support, and I'm so thankful for him. And Logan, one of my twins is here, so I am really thankful for that. And I'm just excited to go ahead and get into what I wanted to talk about today. Now, I had asked Sister Jen Hogue if she wouldn't mind, she might have passed off the responsibility, but if you have a three by five card, if you could take that out now, that would be great. And we're gonna do something a little bit different. Um, we're gonna start off with a little different way. I'm not reading a scripture quite yet, but I have three questions that I want you to answer. And I would like for you to write the answer on the card, okay? And then when you're finished, we'll just set it aside and then at the end, we're gonna do something with the card. So, the first question is, is I would like for you to write down what God has been talking to you about lately. Actually, I switched up the questions. I have them up there. Question number one, sorry. What, what is a desire? That's the first one. What is a desire of something you want to do, but it has not come to pass yet? And 
not going to make this hard. Just whatever comes to your mind in the beginning is normally the right answer. What is a desire of something you want to do, but it hasn't come to pass yet? Second one, what is something that God has been talking to you about lately? If he has. Has there been something he's just been putting on your heart? What would that be? If you don't have paper, use your phone. You have permission to use your phone if you want. What is something that maybe God has been talking to you about lately? Or it's been going over and over in your mind and you didn't realize maybe it was even from the Lord. And then the third question, what is something that has been taken away from you recently? Or maybe it's been a while, it's been in the past, but it's significant. What is something that has been taken away from you? You need to think about it later and put it down. That's fine. But we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for taking um, time to do that. My scripture verse for today that I um, in praying, it was funny because Pastor Tim, when you told me, um, you asked, can you come? Immediately, this plopped in, in, standing in the hallway, this came to my mind. So I'm going for it. I'm praying the Lord, praying for this service today, and I hope that you get get some healing out of this and, and some encouragement. So Psalms 137, verses 1 through 4. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song, and they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of your songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? So I'm going to be basing a lot of what I'm talking about off of the scripture. I was reading this prior to him uh, talking with me, and it just stuck, it stuck out to me. So the title of my message is this, hanging our harps on the willow. I want us just to, I know we're not standing and that is okay, but I would like us just to bow our heads one more time and ask the Lord just to speak to your heart, maybe open up your heart. Maybe it's been a while since you've even opened up your heart to him, but can we just as a congregation together come before him in the name of Jesus. Lord, I wanna thank you for your word. I wanna thank you for your voice. God, we just ask you that you would speak into our hearts today. Anoint our ears to hear what you have to say. Help us to open up our hearts. Help us to lay aside doubt today. Even though we don't understand things, God, help us, Lord, to be open to you. And we give you the praise in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, by a show of hands, has anybody been to a foreign country before? Hey, awesome. There's a lot of you. That's great. Whenever I was in Bible school a long time ago, um, I had the opportunity to go on a missions trip to Russia, and we got to go to Belarus and Poland and the Czech Republic. It was awesome. Um, however, what was not awesome about that, and the very first thing that comes to my mind when I think of Russia, is my roommate that I got paired with, her luggage was lost. It did not come with her all the way to Russia. So guess who, you know, when you pack, you have to pack for just what you need because the weight of the luggage. And so I just had just enough shampoo and just enough conditioner and just enough socks and you name it, right? And so, okay, I'm going to have to help my sister out here. So 
She starts, bar I mean, we're going on a week now. This is bad. So I had to start having her go <laughs> borrow from somebody else. But I'll never forget, we had to wash our laundry. Like, we just had to wash it, right? And so we're here we are in Russia. And I don't know if anybody's been there. Anybody been to Russia? The water was orange. <laughs> kind of like Edgewood water. <laughs> Sometimes Edgewood water gets orange, yeah. It's pretty bad. And so I remember having to wash my clothes in this water. And, you know, you have to hurry up and do it real fast. Well, I had a nice pair of white, clean socks hanging over my bathtub. All right. Just whatever. Ba it was really like the square, tiny little thing. It wasn't even what you could call a bathtub. It was a little wobbly. And so I, I hung my socks over the edge. And my roommate, bless her soul, took my sock and stuffed it down the drain to provide water for her bath. And I don't know why you'd want to lay in orange water, but okay. So then I come back out and I have an orange sock. <laughs> it will not get out the rust that was in it. And so that's what I think of Russia. And then I think about how, you know, you go to this foreign place and, and you don't know the language. Um, the food, you have to get used to the food. It, it's, it's not, you know, it's different. Um, the whole fact of uh, the culture, everything, before Uber was a thing here in the States, Uber was a thing in Russia like 25 years ago. And believe me, I thought I was going to die whenever we had to get in the back of a Russian man's car and he drove us. It was crazy. So these are just some of the things. Everything was foreign. Everything was strange. And so the only thing that was comfortable to me, and I know, Sister Wendy, you're not going to like this, but we got to Poland and I saw the golden arches. There was a McDonald's, <laughs> and it was familiar. I found something that was familiar. It was exciting. So when the Bible is talking about how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land, the Webster's Dictionary for the word foreign means strange and unfamiliar. You know what else was familiar, though, whenever I was over in Russia? It was the presence of God. Because when we were over there, that same God that we worship here is the same God that was there. And it was beautiful to witness that. And I know we have missionaries out of this church, the Paces and, and others, um, but they can attest to that. But I want us to give a backdrop to the Psalms. So... From 597 B.C. to 538 B.C., the people of Israel experienced some of the most gruesome and terrible times in their entire history. I'm going to give you just a little bit of backdrop here. The whole psalm that I just read is an expression of grief. Nothing in this psalm is happy. The psalm described a time when most of the people of Jerusalem were captured and they were taken to Babylon. And the prophet said that they were going to be there for 70 years. The words in Psalms 137 comes from a nation of people who have been vanquished by the armies of the Babylonian Empire. Their beloved city and their holy city, Jerusalem, had been sacked and it had been set on fire. Can you imagine your homeland just, just set on fire? The, everything that you own, the beautiful temple that was built by King Solomon had been desecrated and it was left to ruins. And the once proud nation of Israel had been placed in chains and marched away as slaves into a strange and foreign land. One study I read was pretty gruesome. It said that the Babylonians marched them right through the dead bodies. Possibly people they even knew. Maybe their family, maybe their neighbors. These people, the Israelites, who were known throughout the world, they were known 
for their beautiful songs of worship to God, of their salvation, they have now been reduced to listening to the taunts and to the ridicules of their captors. The Babylonian king at the time, name sounds familiar, Nebuchadnezzar. He had just defeated the southern kingdom of Judah and carried the people of Judah into exile in several phases. You see, Nebuchadnezzar had watched these Israelites. They, he watched them grow into a mighty group. They had overcome many, many trials in their history. Nebuchadnezzar understood their God was guiding them by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He knew if he went against Israel, he was going to have to go against their God. And these are the people, the very same people, who saw their God provide for them in so many miraculous ways. God had parted the Red Sea for them to cross. And, and he had saved them from Pharaoh and Pharaoh's armies. These are the people. And now look where they're at. The Babylonians had listened carefully to Israel's songs of praise because they studied their enemy. They heard them as they sang one of the Psalms of David. They listened as the Israelites sang. And I have this verse. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp around against me, my heart shall not fear. Thou war shall rise against me in this, will I be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. These are the same people just like you and me. Nebuchadnezzar had to somehow disconnect them from their God. They seem pretty strong. I will completely remove them from their homeland, he thought. Make them worship Baal and oppress them. And that's where we found verse 1, 2, 3, 4. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and wept because we remembered Zion. Upon the willows in the midst of it, we hung up our harps. How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? They laid down their harps on the willows and they let their song die in that moment. They hung up their harps. The English words in the Psalms, pretty sad. But the words have an even different sad sound in the Hebrew language. Psalms 137, 1 through 3, leading up to verse 4, repeat nine times the pronoun ending in N-U, which was meaning we are our, which sounds mournful. It was like crying, oh, and woe, repeatedly. By the rivers of Babylon, they wept over the death of so many loved ones. They were so stricken with grief. They are not home anymore. Everything they knew was destroyed. They were weeping over the loss of everything. They wept over Jerusalem and her great temple. The agony of that forced march from Judea to Babylon. They wept over the cruelty of their captors. Wept over the fact that they had such a great past. And, and now we don't know what the future is going to be like. It seemed pretty bleak. And then to know that their sin had invited such judgment from God. There was so much loss. This was probably a Levite speaking here in Psalms. And Levites were accustomed to music, both vocal and instrumental in the service of the temple. They took care of their musical instruments and they preserved them from the enemy. This was their ministry. They carried these harps with them to Babylon in hope of returning with them to use them as before 
or maybe to solace themselves and others in captivity, though now they had no heart to take use of them as before. Their sorrow was so great, and so they hung them up on the willows in shame and defeat. The psalmist says, it was there at the river's edge, among the willows, in a mood of spiritual dejection and defiance that they decided to hang up their instruments of music and worship. There was no song left to sing. We don't need to use them. We're in trouble. The harps were a symbol of ministry. It was a symbol of destiny. It was a symbol of purpose and their future. They were captive physically, emotionally, and mentally. To them, God was a far away and wasn't going to return. See, they were music makers who played for the singers and aided in the worship of the temple. They once provided a valuable service to the people of God. So now that the Babylonians had this influx of Jews in their land because they've been taken captive, in celebration of this great victory over Israel, these captors mocked the people of God with cruel requests. They would say, hey, sing us one of your songs of Zion. <laughs> A happy song. Any song the Israelites had was about praising God. It was about lifting him up. And the people of God replied with a question that I'm wondering was probably directed more to themselves than to their captors. But how shall I sing the Lord's song in this strange land? Here we are in captivity. And you want us to sing these songs to praise to our God? How should we sing about the blessings of God when we're living in the midst of our own captivity? We are literally enslaved by our own sinful passions. And the captors are making fun of them. Sing us one of your songs. One of your famous ones. Yet no one had a song left. They did it and they could not sing. Can I tell you something? The enemy of our soul laughs at us. And he taunts at us. He accuses us. He makes our wounds laugh at us. He takes the woundings we have received. And like, just to wreak havoc at it. He likes to bring it up. And, and keep you bound. He takes these woundings and he uses them to filter our perception through our life. Which leads us to a lot of unhealthy thoughts. And then those thoughts produce a lot of unhealthy behaviors. Has anyone here felt this way before where you just don't feel like singing? Life got too much. Your grief is too great. A place that makes no sense. Discouragement. Maybe you went through a divorce or a breakup. A, a, a place that you don't understand. You feel hopeless. Has anyone felt this way before? It's tough. Maybe it's sickness. And you're living in it and it's just been too long. It's tough. It's a tough place to be. How long have you been weeping for something different? Stuck in the why, stuck in the not understanding. What's the use? It doesn't make sense. Feeling captive, maybe feeling like your ministry was taken from you or feeling let down or forsaken. You feel in bondage, stuck in the waiting. This is where the accuser of the brethren just loves to wait. And he captures us. And when we feel the most vulnerable at this spot, that's where he taunts us. Just like the captors. Even though the conquerors wanted them to sing for their amusement, the song was not there. These songs were more than performance. It was more than a performance. It would come from their relationship with God. 
It would take them a long time for them to have a restored relationship with God in a foreign land. Maybe you've lost your joy and your hope. Your re See, when we get here and we've lost our joy in a foreign land, and we can't understand God's ways and why he would allow certain things to happen to us. You know what? To be honest with you, our, our relationship with Jesus can suffer here. Because what are you doing, Lord? I don't understand what is going on. Why did you allow this to happen? If you've ever walked through a death of a spouse, you know what I mean. If you've ever walked through the darkness of loneliness, you know if you've ever walked through sickness, loss of health, depression, and it's so hard to get out of that depression, you can't move forward in it. You understand what I'm talking about, feeling captive, and that hole that you can't get out of. If you've ever walked through financial difficulty, you know what I'm talking about. If you're finding yourself in a season of life, now where you don't think you matter anymore because life's gone by. I've already put in the work. Can I, t can I speak a moment to our elders? We need you. We really do need you. Please don't think that my life has already gone and I've already poured into what I need. And so now I'm just going to hang my harp, my ministry on the tree. We need you. There's a reason why you're here. And you can provide so much mentorship and counsel to the younger generations. Don't hang your harp on the willow. God is still wanting to use you. We need your encouragement and testimonies. He put a calling on your life that's not completed yet because you're still here. There are times when we certainly don't feel like we are more than conquerors. We don't. What happens whenever things are so broken in the inside of us, we just don't have the strength? Can I remind you this morning that God loves you? I feel that so strong today to tell you that God loves you and he sees you he sees every detail of your life. He sees the circumstance that you're in that maybe no one else can understand, but he's there and he sees. Zephaniah 317, I love this scripture. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over you with joy. He will rest in his love, and he will joy over you with singing. Do you know that our Heavenly Father sings over you? He does. When we don't feel like singing and we don't have a song left inside of us, oh, if you could tune in your ears to know that your Heavenly Father loves you and he is singing over you. Even though this passage of scripture feels so hopeless, something stands out to me. These prisoners brought their harps with them on their march into captivity. What else did they bring? I don't know, but they brought their harp. The city is being burned and loved ones are dying, but they grabbed their harp. How did they know to bring their harp? They didn't have texting back then and sent out a mass text. Hey, everyone, bring your harp over to Babylon. They didn't have a social media page to let everybody know. That harp was their calling. That harp was their ministry. That harp was their purpose. It was like an appendage. They didn't go anywhere without them. And, the ca and here's another thing as I was thinking about this. And the captors allowed them to bring their harps? 
They knew it was a part of them. So can I just put this maybe in a different way here today? The enemy cannot take away your calling. You can't. He cannot take away the calling that he placed on your life. It doesn't matter if you've sinned. It doesn't matter if you have been far away from the Lord. It doesn't matter if you, you left your harp there and it's been a few years. Come on now. That is your calling. God designed you. He sings over you and he's cheering you on. Come on. Get that harp off the tree. Come on. I love you. I have plans for you. There's a purpose for you. No amount of captivity can take that away. No amount of sin, no amount of shame, no amount of hopelessness. Once you're called, you're called. He designed each of us with talents and giftings. And we need to bring our harps with us when we're even in hopeless situations. They were in shackles. They were tormented, walked through death, but they brought their harp. Somewhere along the way, though, they had their calling, they had their ministry, they had their harp. But through the daily diet of the enemy's verbal assaults and insults, it took its toll. And in response to the taunts of their captors, even though they brought the harp, they hung it up. They didn't destroy them. Or throw them away, but they hung them up. And again, somewhere, there has to have been something in the back of their mind thinking that there could come a time when they would be able to pick up those harps and play the Lord's songs once again. I, I really feel that Psalms 137 gives us permission for us to feel and experience the grit of life. I think sometimes we look at the harp and the tree and we think, oh, how could they do that? Or become judgmental with it, have some sort of self-righteous attitude with it. But can I tell you what? We all have harps on the tree. Every single one of us have put something away because we couldn't deal. Maybe we, we, we've lost that, that relationship. We've, we've, we've got ourselves into addiction and and we feel shameful and so how can God even love me because I've done so much but it gives us permission taking the mask off to say you know what I've struggled I'm not okay I have had this addiction I have had this situation happen you know what you went through a divorce too so did I or you went through um Backsliding, so did I. Like, it, it opens up doors to minister to other people. But if, if we just put the mask on and pretend that we're holier than thou and nothing happens, whew, we're, we're not in a good place. God knows what it's like to be broken. And we know that. We, we um, see that whenever he wept with Mary at the death of Lazarus. We know he knows what loneliness feels like whenever he went to Gethsemane and sweat blood in the garden alone. Great, great drops. He experienced anguish of suffering. He's the Messiah, okay? He's the Messiah who also felt abandoned. He is the Messiah that also felt lonely. He is the Messiah that also felt rejection. He felt, he came to earth to feel what we would feel so he knows what we're going through. He wants to help us, but our, our, our mind gets in the way. Maybe it's rejection. Somebody in your past didn't love you the way that you needed to be loved and they did not pour into you the way that you needed. Do you know what our Heavenly Father is a father to the fatherless. And he wants to minister to you today. And he wants you to know that just because your relationship wasn't good here, doesn't mean that your relationship can't be good here. 
See, we have finite minds. We have a really, really hard time understanding how our relationship with God can work. Because all we know is the relationships here. And if people fail us here, we're just going to think, well, God, you're going to do it too. But he's not because his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. He loves us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. When he was on the cross, do you know he lamented? Do you know what lamenting means? Crying out, complaining, feeling the grief, crying. Okay, he was lamenting. Remember the phrase, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? There are times when we can feel the same way. God, where are you at? Why have you forsaken me? And he, once again, is telling you today, and I believe this, I love you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. That, that place in your life where things can suddenly change and the rug gets pulled out from under your feet. Maybe you had a ministry and you don't have it now. Or, or maybe your dreams have died a long time ago. I want to ask you, have you, have you hung your harp on the willow? So we know that the accuser wants us to think our life is over. He wants us to think that our dreams are. And I might as well just hang it up on the tree. I'm damaged. No one is going to want me. And he wants us to remain that way, okay? He's got a tactic, and he wants us to remain that way. He wants us to remain distraught. But Ephesians 6.12 says, oh, God, we are wrestling, and we've got to understand this of what's going on. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of the world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Folks, we are wrestling, okay? When you see a wrestling match, is there always one winner, like back and forth? No, sometimes somebody be on top and then the other person will be on top, right? A wrestle is going back and forth. And sometimes I think we get stuck in, well, I can't keep it together. No, we're going to wrestle against flesh and blood. We're going to have triumphs and then we're going to have defeats, okay? We're going to wrestle. There, are, there is a spiritual world out there and that is what we are wrestling and we have to understand what we are fighting. Satan knows that he doesn't always have to cause you to fa fall into temptation. He doesn't. To accomplish his goal, he doesn't have to always do that. You know what he does? He walks through your past and your issues of your life, and he brings down your faith. He brings down your hope. And then he gets in your mind, and he torments you with negative thoughts. You're not good enough. I'm not good enough. No one loves me. I can't trust anyone because everybody hurts me. Every authority figure has failed me, and so I'm never going to trust an authority figure again. Getting our affirmation instead of from Jesus, but our own self-worth. Right? This is how he does it. But the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10 to 5, these scriptures are very important to fight the battle of the mind. That's why I had these up here. Because every scripture I'm going to read is on the mind. And I would encourage you just to write these scriptures down. 2 Corinthians 10 5 says, Demolish arguments and every pretension that sets up, sets up itself against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. When we take every thought to captivity, that means we are gaining control over what we are thinking about ourselves, about our life. If the enemy can get us in our thought lives, he's got us. So past mistakes, past shame. How can God love you? Broken trust in relationships. Listen. God's not waiting for you to be perfect to get your harp off the tree. He's not. Pastor Sam, I'll never forget. Years ago, you said this, and then I've heard it since then. It's so true. 
But you said you don't get good to get God. You get God to get good, right? We are not going to have to become perfect to ask Jesus if we can have a relationship with him. That's where he gets us. We get stuck in our own mind. How does God want to have a relationship with me when I keep messing up? Because he loves you. He loves you. He is not out there to strike you with lightning. He has grace and he has mercy and he wants you to come to him. We are not just physical human beings and we got to understand this. We have a mind, we have a body, and we have a spirit connection. And do you know that that mind, body, and spirit actually affects our central nervous system? Our mind is our choices, the way that we think, the way that we feel and behave, our, all our emotions. And the spirit is a relationship with God. It's walking in the spirit and not the flesh. It's being able to identify subconscious unhealthy thoughts and beliefs. And then you've got the physical. Well, we know how to take the physical well, we know that, okay, it's obvious. We need to get plenty of sleep. We need to eat the right nutrition. We need to get exercise. Um, we need to, you know, have fun. We, we need to do these things. But sometimes we do one out of the three. Sometimes we're just focusing on the physical, but we're not focusing on the spiritual, okay? We're not focusing on the mind. So, we can't just leave one of them out. We are all three, therefore we're affected by all three. So the best way to put an end to unhealthy thought patterns is you have to recognize it. In order to be healed in your mind of anxious thoughts, intrusive thoughts, negative thought patterns, depression, these type of thoughts, we have to identify it. Because we can't, we can't defeat what we can't define. We have to identify it if we're going to defeat it. So here's the thing. You can't get your mind in the right order until you get your spiritual self in the right order. We need to heal through the word. That's how we heal. We can try counseling, which is wonderful. And if it's not spirit-led then you're opening up yourself so, to some things where they're not using Jesus as the healer, right? They're not using him as a counselor. But whenever you open yourself up to God and you include him in your healing journey and you use scriptures, that is how we heal our mind, through the word. A lot of times, if we get our spiritual side right, then it's going to positively affect our mind, the way that we think, the f we feel the way we behave. See, having spiritual health, we have a strong relationship with Christ. We're walking in the spirit. And what happens is, is when we take these Bible verses and say, Lord, I want to help me to ca ca take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, you are literally rewiring your mind for healthy thinking. If so think about this. If I didn't think that way, and all I thought about is God is disappointed in me. He loves everybody else, and I see that in the scripture, but I, and I believe it. I believe that God loves people, but I just can't believe he loves me. When you think on those thoughts continuously, there is some things happening in your brain. And side note, Dr. Carolyn Leaf is awesome. And I, I know that there's been a lot of people in this congregation um, that Victoria, I love what you guys are doing. And uh, Sister Winnie, I know that there's a lot of teaching with this. But your thoughts are actual structures. Every time you have a thought, it's a structure. And that structure fills the landscape of your brain. So the more negative thoughts that you're thinking, it's going to change the structure of your brain, okay, through neuropathways.
But the more that you're thinking positive, guess what that does? Changes the structure of your brain. And so the more that you can take every thought into captivity and um, take that thought, how we do that is recognize the thought. Okay, I know what this is. This is a negative thought. Um, first of all, I identified it. Second of all, I'm going to rebuke it in Jesus' name. And then third of all, I'm going to speak back to it. Now, here's the thing. Thoughts create feelings, though. they are structures in your brain, but they also create a feeling. And that's where we get thrown off because we feel like nobody loves us. We feel like we can't trust anyone because we've experienced this, and so it just stays with us, okay? But... Once we start learning to capture these thoughts and take them into captivity, rebuke them in Jesus' name, we have to understand that I got to speak opposite to that thought, okay? So if I feel like I'm not good enough, I'm going to have to say, Lord, I guess I'm good enough. Now, that doesn't feel right because our feelings get in the way. You cannot go by your feelings. Your feelings lie. They're not the truth. So as you talk back to the thought, then you find a scripture and the scripture that goes with his thoughts that he has for you. And it's just something that I, I just see as a pattern myself. It's no other, um, it's just Lisa saying, capture it, take it, take it, cap take it by, um, capture it, second, defeat it by uh, rebuking it in Jesus name, speak the opposite and then find a scripture verse. So what's gonna happen is over time when you're not thinking just on the negative, there are gonna be some situations happening up here in the brain and it's gonna start changing because God has created us with something that is called neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is amazing because you can actually rewire your brain through thoughts. And God designed it this way because he knew that the battle would be where? In your mind. So he has given us tools. He's given us tools to not keep the harps on the willow. Because we will keep the harps on the willow when we stay in the negative stinking thinking. So God has given us tools today. We have strongholds. That, that, that's what the Bible says. There are strongholds in the mind that are keeping us from picking up the harps. 2 Corinthians 10.4, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We have to come against that stronghold in Jesus' name. We have to identify it. We have to rebuke it. We got to speak opposite to that thought and find a scripture. When when things can get a little strange in your life and it's not what you're used to and it's foreign, how does your praise sound? When life throws a curveball you didn't ask for, how does your praise sound? We know that in the Bible, it talks about Ecclesiastes 3.1 and there's that whole, there's a season for everything. All right, so we know that we all walk through seasons and maybe the season that you're finding in is dark. I don't know what's going on in your season tonight or this morning, but can I encourage you that Jesus sees you right where you're at and he knows, he knows the thoughts, he understands. We, we walk through loneliness, we can walk through singleness, we can walk through grief, we can, we can walk through these things and they're so hard to walk alone. But if you find yourself in one of these seasons, please don't be afraid. And this is where I feel really passionate. God wants you to call on him. He's just waiting to walk with you through that season. That's what he's wanting to do. You don't have to have your act together. What do we do for seasons? When it turns summer, winter, or fall? Well, we can't change them. We have no control, right? When it's winter, we put a coat on, though. So we have to kind of adjust to the season. So if you're finding yourself in a different season today, adjust to it. Maybe it's not life like you know it normally, but adjust 
Maybe it's getting up just to brush your teeth and asking the Lord to help you for the day and, and going about your job and it's all confusing. You don't know why you're in this season, but just get up. Start singing if you haven't been singing in a while. Find your song. Find the song. As I'm pulling this together, I know that we've made mistakes. And I know that we have consequences for those mistakes. But don't let it stop you from getting your heart today. We are our own worst enemy sometimes, and we're going to beat ourselves up and punish ourselves because we're ashamed. But I want to speak against shame right now in Jesus' name. Don't let shame hold you back. He is waiting. He is waiting. Um, if I could have the musicians come up, that, that would be great. We... We are in the last days, right? We understand that more than anything else. We are in the last days. And the thing about it is, is the devil is really working overtime. He is. The enemy is working overtime. I've never seen it like this. Um, the amount of anxiety, the amount of just the antichrist spirit is just, it's, it's everywhere. He wants... He wants us to lose our voice. But like I said before, once God has called you, that calling has not been taken away. We could sit in the would haves and the could haves and the should haves, but there is a reason why you're here today. And I believe that with my whole heart. There's a reason why everybody that is here today is here because there is something that the Lord is wanting to share with you today. And I hope that you can hear his voice. If you find that it's fear of picking the harp, then I'm not good enough. What will people think? You know what? I've been there. How can he use me? You know what? He can. He can. He can put you in places where you never thought you could be because you already just wrote it off. Well, I would like for you to take your piece of paper, throw it down, and take a look at it. Let's revisit these questions for a minute. What is something that has been taken away from you recently? What is the desire of something you want to do, but it hasn't come to pass yet? What has God been talking to you about lately? Whatever you have on your paper, is that what's on your heart on the willow tree? Is that your harp on the willow? God wants to speak to you. He is here. He's just waiting. He's been here the whole time. If you lost your song, pick it back up. If you lost your relationship with Jesus, pick it back up. There's stuff for you to do. There's a ministry for you to do. There's a calling that God has placed in your life. I'd like us to stand. take that paper and if you want I'm going to invite you to come down if you feel more comfortable sitting in the pew that's fine whatever you want to do but I want you to take the paper and I want you to give it to Jesus and say Lord I've realized I've hung some harps and I've, I've been bound in my mind with some thoughts that the enemy has prisoned me with and has taunted me with but God, today I want to pick up that harp off the tree again. And I want to recommit my life to you. 
I want to lay down at your feet and give you every problem that I have, give you every emotion that I have, every feeling that I have that doesn't make sense. I want to thank you that you're meeting me. When you come up here, God is meeting you today. He's not going to leave you hanging. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. 